Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank ECLAS and um, the organizers here in Oviedo, uh, who I by now feel is a kind of second home for me. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that as I've been here. Uh, extremely grateful to Isabel Liamar for the uh, opportunities, invitations, and friendship over the last years, and also the opportunity to work with some of the students here, including Elena, who's here, uh, and Paola, who's also been around here. So thank you so much. Um, the piece that I'm going to talk about today has two contexts that I want to briefly refer to so you understand how and why the convergence of these ideas came to be. Uh, my first piece about Jean-Michel Basquiat is called The Writing on the Wall, and it's in Boricua Pop. What I was trying to address there, that to some extent I'm still trying to address, given that the scholarship remains very resistant to this idea, was what was the Puerto Rican context for the uh, study of Basquiat's work. Um, so I started there in that point, and then more recently, uh, I've been editing a book that's coming out from the University of Arizona Press in the fall uh, called Sovereign Acts that was based on a conference that I organized where people from Puerto Rico, Pacific Islands, um, indigenous communities in Canada and the U.S. got together, um, and we were examining or re-examining uh, and recontextualizing the concept of sovereignty. Now, it's really hard not to see how Basquiat uh, reflected on this, although it's totally this, this uh, analysis about how sovereignty figures in the, con in the work of Basquiat is pretty much absent from the current literature. So in a way, this, this uh, essay is trying to uh, bring those two points of reflection together. So, uh, King of the Lion starts with two epigraphs, one from Robert Farris Thompson that says, from the subway crown motif, king of the line is always there. And from Jean-Michel Basquiat, every line means something. When evoking artist Jean-Michel Basquiat, it is difficult not to think of kings. And today, I will offer one way to tell that story. Since the beginning of his career in the early 1980s, Basquiat consistently probed the limits and possibilities of sovereign symbols, particularly crowns. This is evident in multiple ways, from his signature sign, a pared down three-peak crown that he deployed in thousands of paintings, drawings, and objects, to the fact that he sometimes styled his own hair in crown-like spikes, using his body as a mobile canvas to claim his status as king of the art world. In the words of curator Richard Marshall, Basquiat continuously crowned himself king of painters, calling on fortune to extend his status. Yet, what exactly did being king mean for and in Basquiat? At one level, for Basquiat and others of his generation, to be art royalty was to be recognized as a major artist and among or above white figures such as Leonardo da Vinci, this is uh, Basquiat's own twisted tribute to, to da Vinci, and Pablo Picasso as well as famous contemporary painters like Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, and Cy Tombley. Similarly, it meant to conquer all media, that is, to have your work featured in every important gallery, museum, biennial, and art magazine in the world, as well as to have legions of prestigious patrons and corporate heads buying and bowing to your talent. Moreover, within the context of the 1980s art world, when art acquired the liquidity of money and artists were treated as celebrities, royal status, including having an entourage, who catered to your every wish, parting the crowds when you pulled up at nightclubs, and having access to expensive goods, including clothes and drugs. In some, being king meant undisputed stardom, a status unavailable to the vast majority of artists. Basquiat's interest in crowns and other sovereignty symbols, however, went beyond a desire to be rich and famous. It also went further than what critics Jordana Moore, Kelly Jones, and Richard Marshall have described as Basquiat's quote-unquote obsession, fascination, or interest in commerce, although this is part of the story. Basquiat, I maintain, was less fixated on trade than invested in laying bare the relationship between capital, modernity, Western sovereignty, and black and other dispossessed groups, particularly in the Americas. He was likewise consumed by a desire to upend Eurocentric knowledge systems and institutions that view non-Western practices as the source of raw materials for their own higher practice, 
leveraging the might of black arcanes towards a different way of knowing, relating, and being. Or as Basquiat once put it in a poet, poem, you can't sell a human, you've done the scratching, this was not blank. In reading Basquiat in this way, I am not implying that he's theorizing in conventional philosophical or political science terms. Rather, I am saying that visual production can, as Robert Stam and Ella Shohar suggest in relation to film, quote, generate concepts and do theory in sensorial, synesthetic, audiovisual blocks of sound, image, and movement. And that Basquiat indeed produced critical, complex, and implicated thought on sovereignty and the traumatizing global colonial order that came about with the European conquest and settlement of the Americas. Specifically through the acts of collage, borrowing, repeating, improvising, and copying words, images, and symbols, Basquiat generated a dense sensorial archive that revised, related, and recontextualized black Caribbean and other minoritized knowledges, memories, and affects. While Basquiat's work unfolds, let's say, in linear fashion, there are distinct periods that I'm gonna to allude to, his method also allows readers to make conceptual and sensorial connections across time and space within and beyond text. In this regard, Basquiat's production is akin to a decolonial hypertext, where knowledge and information is presented as a linked network of nodes which readers are free to navigate in a nonlinear fashion. Basquiat's thought then moved in and away from sovereignty during the seven years of his professional production. Although sovereign symbols ap appear more centrally in the 1980-1983 period, they continue to be present in his work until nearly the end of his career. Equally important, they're waning in the context of other shifts in Basquiat's art, such as the increased visualization of flight and Afro-diasporic spiritual figures, can be understood in part as a reckoning with the complexities and limitations of sovereign discourse as a vocabulary and practice of freedom. In the process, Basquiat's reworking demonstrates not only an awareness of the centrality of representation to asserting sovereignty, but also raises two core questions that have haunted not only Basquiat, but many other black artists and political thinkers throughout the 20th century. Is black sovereignty, even of or in the imagination, possible or desirable? Can sovereignty ultimately offer a path to freedom and joy? This first section is called Enter the King. Basquiat's first elaborate painting to include a crown may have been this one, untitled from 1981, where he draws a blue cityscape populated by buildings, street signs, and a plane flying overhead. These images are in turn related to other keywords and symbols, a crown in the middle of the composition, a crown male head to the left, and a notary seal to the right of the crown. In the bottom right of the canvas, Basquiat writes the word respo, a truncated form of the Spanish word respeto, and places it at the top of one of the buildings. In this first iteration of the crown, Basquiat appears to simultaneously confer value, the seal of approval, on specific objects and demand respect from the city. At this point in his career, the crown emerges in critic Richard Marshall's words as Basquiat's own trademark, as well as a symbol of respect and admiration that he bestows. Whereas in Untitled, the human form is racially ambiguous, the vast majority of Basquiat's crown subjects before and after were black men. In numerous works on canvas and paper through 1983, Basquiat painted crowns on top of the heads or names of both famous and invisible black men to salute their achieve achievements obtained against great odds, dignify the pain of being measured by Eurocentric definitions of value, and memorialize their contributions to black culture and possibility. During this period, Basquiat also crowned invisible, black men to restore the honor denied by racism to the unsung many. With equal force, Basquiat acknowledged boxing legends Jack Johnson, Sugar Ray Robinson, Charlie Parker, and anonymous men arrested by unscrupulous of cops and sweepers in prison style uniforms holding a broom in the manner of an African warrior posing with his spear. In this iteration, the crowns offered a pathway to social recognition and subjectivity. The visual act of crowning, however, not only confers worth, it is also a sovereign act in itself, as it directs the viewer's gaze to the subject's upper bodies, particularly their heads. While Basquiat has called his portrayal of faces instinctual, and journalists like Kathleen McGuinan have related them to the early influence of Picasso, his, intention, his attention to heads is neither arbitrary nor conceptually resemble Picasso's. As scholar Simon Gigandi has argued, 
Picasso viewed African art objects, including sculpted heads and masks, as means or raw material to modernize European painting, rather than as a form of engagement with black bodies, histories, or aesthetics. This is, of course, a paradigmatic example. In contrast, the century of the crown heads in Basquiat's work positions black subjects on higher ground, moving them away from visual representations that locate them in subordinate or subservient positions in relation to other figures, objects, or aesthetic tradition. Consistently, Basquiat's envisions black heads as site of black spiritual power, intellect, and beauty. And this is a piece called Flexible. In doing so, Basquiat dialogues with multiple African practices, including sub-Saharan sculpture, in which the head is represented as exceptionally large and often highlighted by wearing elaborate hairstyles and headdresses, among other items. In Yoruban thought, one of the most influential in the Americas, the head is also a metaphor for supremacy and chieftainship, connoting the first in rank and status. In addition to signifying social and symbolic rank, the head is the place of Ashe, spirit, as well as a person, Iwa, nature. Consistently, the head is thought to be com uh, composed of an exterior appearance and inner qualities, the latter being the most essential, as it stands over rules, guides, and controls a person's actions. The importance of the head is similarly evident in Afro-diasporic arts and religious practices, such as the Haitian voodoo concept of metet, literally the master of the head. Within voodoo, every person is born with a metet, the master spirit that is particular to each individual and serves as his or her guardian angel. The head is also the seat of bottom power, where a bottom spirit rests when it enters the body during possession, as Susan Preston has noted. Equally important service to the metet is the form of offerings, prayer, and other rituals is assumed to make humans stronger, his or her magic better and more effective, thus endowing him with greater power. Closer to home, the crown also invokes spatialized social struggles in New York. Given Basquiat's roots in graffiti, his first artistic setting, he was likely aware of the use of crowns to signify status, identity, and power by individuals and gangs. During this time, graffitis also competed for the title of king of specific subway lines and other spaces. The one that had the most visible tags or was up the longest at any given moment was recognized as king of the line, until inevitably he or she would be knocked off by another more prolific or visible writer. In the words of gra a graffiti is called Fox, he says, I can't rest a day, go to the beach, cause some other gonna get ahead of me. They want to be king like they know I am. Moreover, when a graffiti writer becomes famous, another recognizer's tag, a crown could appear next to a tag to signify this status. The trope of crowning is similarly present in broader Afro-diasporic cultural practice where sports figures, singers, and other artists often claim royal titles to both connote their superior abilities and challenge racial and gender hierarchies. Among the many examples in the jazz world alone, a fundamental site for Basquiat's thought are Count Basie, Lady Day, and Duke Ellington. The competition of wall writing, the elevation of black artists, and the recognition of racially and socially expendable people similarly evokes and enacts what literary theorist Mikhail Bakhtin once called the carnavalesque. As Bakhtin suggested, in European carnival, not only do people in the lower social rungs represent themselves as royalty, and real royalty is made fun of, but also social and political life itself is represented as a perpetual crowning and uncrowning. In the Caribbean carnival context, the crowning of low status subjects is present in the practice of playing royal, a masquerading technique that highlights how every person can be as regal as kings and queens who are ultimately viewed as ordinary people. The crowns then have the effect of redefining what nobility is and how and by whom this status is confirmed. Through crowning, Basquiat redefined mobility as, I quote, a figure of speech that could be bestowed or gained by black artistic imagination. Within and across text, the crown functions as a metaphor in scholar Mark Riffing's sense of redescribing reality, disoriented current modes of description and classification. Given its multiple associations, then, it is not surprising that Basquiat also deployed crowns to connote his own worth in the art world. Sovereign discourse and acts were an accessible idiom to signify a desire to be seen as great, and established genealogies that secure one's place as a legitimate successor in a line of art kings. As Greg Tate has observed, for Basquiat making it meant going down in history, Rank beside the great white fathers of Western painting in the eyes of the major critics, museum curators, and art historians who ultimately determined such things. 
A self-referential example is Red Kings, a painting that comprises two crowned and simply drawn faces against a red background. Within the eyes, nose, and mouth of the face to the left, the letters B, Q, and S are drawn, suggesting that the image may refer to Basquiat himself. On the right, there is a second crowned face, which has been read by some critics as reimagining a drawing by Picasso titled Self-Portrait Mujan. If this second figure can be viewed as referencing Picasso, that's Picasso's piece, the text implies that Basquiat is as great as king of the art world as the Spanish master. The succession motif also appears in other works, such as Dos Cabezas. A playful self-portrait reportedly produced a few hours after Basquiat visited Andy Warhol. Here, Basquiat paints himself to the right of Warhol, his, crown, uh, his own crown-like hair standing on end and reaching slightly higher above Warhol, whose face is, however, larger in the frame. The ways that crowns may denote artistic talent likewise makes them accessible symbols to represent the battle over who can compete for and be excluded from royal status in our history. By seizing the signs of sovereign power, Basquiat aimed to take on the racism of the art world itself, an industry described by critic Greg Tate during the 1980s as, I quote, a bastion of white supremacy, a sconce of the wealthy whose high wall barricades are matched only by Wall Street and the White House and whose exclusionary practices are enforced 24 7, 365. Through crown heads, Basquiat sought to challenge the subordination of artists to both white and money interests by bringing together two equally loaded terms that were deemed separate and incompatible by era American cultural criticism blackness and sovereignty. To raise one of the ultimate questions of Western art who are the two sovereigns of the modern art world, artists or patrons? Basquiat's emphasis on the sovereignty of the artist recalls the Spanish painter Diego Velázquez's move in his famous work of Las Meninas. While we concur with our historian Stradrava Gugleta that Las Meninas emblematizes modern rather than a classic episteme, as historian Michel Foucault has argued, he nevertheless suggested that one of the reasons that Las Meninas opens to modernity is because for the first time in Western art, the artist dared to imagine himself as sovereign of the canvas, equal to the king who was his patron. That space where the king and his wife hold sway, writes Foucault, belongs equally well to the artist and to the spectator. <coughs> Before this point, the European artist's role was to create images for and of royalty to praise and sustain dynasties. Velázquez, however, not only turned a royal portrait into a self-portrait, he depicted himself among the royal entourage and visualized himself as part of the royal family. By placing the painter as part of sovereign power, Velázquez portrays the royal family as his subjects as well. Basquiat extended Velázquez's critique as he thought to erode Western conceptions of royalty as inherently white European and of noble or upper class, yet both artists understood that the exercise of sovereignty requires aesthetic acts, and that artistic production is not only essential to the idea of sovereign power, but also to the overthrow of specific sovereigns within the cultural sphere. In this regard, both artists are part of the complex process of the secularization of sovereign symbols that accelerated during the 17th century with the expansion of capitalism. As the literary critic Gail Turley Houston has argued, the power of European monarchies as the idea of sovereignty itself became increasingly aligned with the cultural rather than political meaning of representation. Significantly, Basquiat not only locates struggles over sovereignty within the cultural realm, he also consistently gives artists the upper hand. This reminds of a cultural critic's did Hebditch observation that Basquiat wanted to play his part in the restoration of the canvas king, whose authority and privileged truth claims had been seriously eroded by two decades of art theory and practice. This may also account for why in Basquiat's paintings, very few of the real kings, rulers, or military leaders, such as Napoleon, Mussolini, or even Haitian revolutionary hero Toussaint Louverture, are visualized as wearing crowns. Overall, the crown rarely represents actual sovereigns, mere heads of state. Um, Basquiat's sovereign acts are never made on behalf of states or nations. Instead, the crowns recognize those who are accomplished kings of imagination and connote the creative act of imagining oneself as sovereign, having a big head. This distinction may also partly explain why in contrast to the crowns of actual monarchs, which are generally very elaborate, adorned with precious stones and other, other symbols of rank and power, Basquiat's own are abstract and copyrighting, copyrighted, suggesting that modern sovereignty has more to do with commodified representation than state power, and that ideas are more important than physical property. 
At the same time, the crown and other sovereign symbols refer to struggles beyond the art world. It explicitly names and calls attention to the devastation of a very specific design, the European Settler Colonial Project. Between 1982 through 1985, Basquiat expands his critique of racism and coloniality while experimenting with multiple pan multi-panel paintings, individual canvases with exposed stretch bars, and increasingly dense writing and collage. Through more elaborate means, Basquiat develops a detailed critique of the long-term devastation brought on by European settler colonial capitalism, which in the name of kings and capital, resulted in the conquest and enslavement of Africans and indigenous people throughout the Americas. In these works, Basquiat underscores not the power of black sovereigns, but how European and American sovereignty and its symbols are implicated in colonial dispossession of knowledge and space. The toxic power of sovereign symbols is manifest in a number of Basquiat's best known paintings, including the aptly titled The Dutch Settlers, and the one I'm gonna talk about today, Native Carrying Guns, Bibles, Amorites on Safari. At the top of the canvas, Basquiat provides a relatively rare humorous touch by writing colonization part two in a series, volumes six, arguably referring to the European colonization of Africa and the ongoing reconfiguration of colonialism at a global scale, which includes not only the first wave of European colonialism by Spain and Portugal in the 16th century, followed by Netherlands and Britain, but also the expansion into Africa in the 19th century and the rise of the United States in the 20th. To the left of the canvas, Basquiat paints a black male figure with a distressed expression holding the side of royal salt ink. Above it is a crossed over crown suggesting the relationship between sovereign power, uh, capitalism, and colonialism. To the right of the black figure is a pared down expressionless safari clad white man holding a rifle. Above him is a series of capitalized words that suggest a plan to how to make good money in savages, poachers, tucks, and skins. In the lower right corner, Basquiat deepens the connection between European sovereignty and capital, not only because the black figure appears worked down to the bone, as Bell Hooks once put it, but by ironically writing, I won't even mention oro. The reference to gold is a reminder of the implicit part one of European colonization, and how this first imperial project is interrelated to the pursuit of gold in Africa during the, 19th, uh, during the 20th century. One way that Basquiat links the two is by tracing a line between the reference to gold and three words, corte, z, corte, and again, corte. The first word can be understood as referring Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conqueror of the Aztecs, where the S is turned into a Z as Puerto Ricans in contrast to Spaniards would pronounce it. The second relates to the king's court, corte, and the last to how the court and Cortés intervention produced a historically devastating corte or cut in the indigenous world. This last cut came after the Aztec ruler Moctezuma gave Cortes gifts of gold, and the latter held Moctezuma hostage and asked for even more gold in ransom. Eventually, the European hunger for gold not only killed Moctezuma, but destroyed the Aztec empire. Moreover, the inclusion of the word savages is significant. On the one, on the one hand, it underscores the importance of categories of knowledge and language to European imperialism. On the other hand, the emphasis on savage is also a call for a different epistemology, one that insists and has faith in the unsettling power of words on the world. As Mark Riffing has argued, the ostensibly animistic belief in the ability of language to affect alterations in the material word, world has been repeatedly castigated in Euro-American intellectual work as savage philosophy. Thus, the error label savage lies in understanding language as exceeding representation and not simply reflecting, but helping constitute material phenomena. This dual process of denigration and counter-signification was very familiar for Basquiat. From the start, art critics insisted on diminishing his work by labeling him a black primitive. Despite his evident knowledge of Euro-American art history and awareness of his relation to it, as Basquiat once observed, most reviewers have this image of me as a wild man, a monkey man. This next section is called Say the Word. While crowns constituted Basquiat's most identi identifiable critical trademark, language was no less central, as is evident in this work, to his critique of Western knowledge, affirmation of other knowledge, and his desire to assert sovereignty over the European art tradition. From his days as part of the wall writing team Seymour with Al Diaz, Basquiat's graffiti, as, uh, literary graffiti, as Haring once called it, sought to occupy public space and gain recognition while challenging the elitism of the art establishment. This is an early Samo uh, graffiti. 
Not coincidentally, graffitis call themselves writers. As, gra as one graffiti put it, I've been the king. The whole school knows what I've done, what I can do again. I got respect. I'm a writer. Once Basquiat moved inside language, or, or, or inside galleries, language also figures as source material and includes quotes from books, poems, aphorism, and other rhythmic language. The extent and tremendous depth of Basquiat's incorporation of language is such that critics such as Fahmu Peku have recently argued that his work should not even be described as paintings at all, but as writings. Writing was his medium. Not surprising, toward the end of his career, as he declared that nothing was to be gained here in art, Basquiat expressed a desire to leave painting behind and become a writer. Yet from the beginning, through drawing together and writing apart, Basquiat sought to detach or delink from colonial systems of knowledge through writing. The centrality of language was not particular to Basquiat. Language was increasingly part of the visual vocabulary of contemporary art, and in the period that Basquiat painted, several aesthetic and intellectual trends, including post-structural literature and conceptual art, focused on language as intrinsically related to knowledge, social order, and ideology. Yet the perceived radicalness of Basquiat's politics was such that his first dealer advised him to avoid text in his paintings, because according to critic René Ricard, the words bothered the collectors, and the words tended more and more frequently to raise unpleasant issues. Contrary to some early reviewers and critics like Mark Myers, who have argued that there is no logic to Basquiat's words, we argue that his words neither lack logic nor that they constitute nonsense writing, another way that's been described. Rather, Basquiat was interested both in the science of sovereignty and the sovereignty of science, that is, the process through which they acquire and sustain power. This may account for his great attention to words that refer to legal processes, such as notary, a seal that makes certain words lawful, as if by magic. Furthermore, he incorporated words into his visual work and engaged in multilingual practices as a method and a politics of transformation. In the words of Ricard, using one or two words, he reveals a political activity, gets the viewer going in the direction he wants. Deploying collage, cut up techniques that were probably inspired by writer William Burroughs, and specific symbols such as the arrow that literally directs the viewer to see these heterogeneous and diverse elements in relation, Basquiat literally draws together and organizes seemingly disparate elements by scale, placing, and color. In this way, Basquiat's method recalls the Guadalupean writer Eduard Glissant's notion of poetics of relation that rejects binary thinking and can be described as a creolization of thought. Or in our historian Henry Skerritt's words, in the concept of relation, Glissant offers a framework to move beyond these polarities. Instead of fixed places of origin, he offers sites of connectivity where multiple histories and ways of being can coexist. Instead of roots, he offers the dynamic process of creolization, a poetics defined by its openness to transformation. In African and Creole fashion, Basquiat cannibalized all he needed from multiple sources. The strategic turn to Creoleness, as Basquiat himself was called it, should not be surprising. Born to a Puerto Rican mother from Brooklyn and a Haitian father, Basquiat had family roots and lived experiences in the Caribbean, a region where the clashes between native African, Asian, and European peoples, cultures, and knowledge systems have produced not only syncretic cultures, but more importantly, or equally important, ways of thinking about culture as syncretic. The ethos itself of popular Caribbean culture and religion is based on creolization, understood as a continuous practice of assemblage, bringing together separate elements of the same or mixed media into Afro an Afro-diasporic cultural matrix. Moreover, Basquiat came of age at a time and a place, New York City, 1960 to 1980, where multiple creolizations involving different ethnic and racial groups were prominently in motion. During Basquiat's childhood and teenage years, New York witnessed the emergence of black and Puerto Rican civil rights movements that would identify cultural production as a fundamental to liberation. Importantly, the struggles of these years, as exemplified by groups like the Young Lords and Real Great Society, were organized as much around basic survival issues such as affordable housing and access to employment as around new ways to understand, represent, and narrate the self and collective history outside colonial conceptions. Basquiat's generation was the first to read black history comic books and other alternative popular reading materials, and from childhood watched political figures such as Malcolm X and Martin Luther King speak on television in the context of broader native Latino and black civil rights movements. On the street, this generation danced to James Brown, I'm Black and I'm Proud, Joe's Cuba's Bugaloo Fusion, as well as disco and funk. In addition, they actively participated in the creation of early New Yorkian poetry, 
Afro-diasporic spoken word and hip hop, cultural forms that also critique racism and coloniality, and were themselves invested in grounded notions of empowerment via the word. Not coincidentally, in the early 1980s, the idiom word carried similar connotations as the Yoruban concept of ashe. When one agreed with someone or when someone did something supreme, our historian Jasmine Ramirez recall, you praise them by saying word. Even further in Haitian voodoo, a subtle but evident source in Basquiat work, words and other symbols are thought to bring new realities into being and unleash powerful forces into the world. The premise is that words and in some ways magical is deeply ingrained in African, Afro-diasporic knowledge systems and popular Christianity. This is particularly evident in transformative practices, that is, acts and rituals in which the right word, the right setting, the right movement, and especially the right attitude may mobilize supernatural forces in order to affect life. Similar, this is present in the previously mentioned concept of ashe, which refers to the power of the word to make things happen, enable change, and bring balance to the world. Finally, Basquiat evoked the process of not only writing, but erasure of stories, knowledge, and people to the self-described practice of scratching on these things, as he said, crossing out, smudging, and painting over letters. He also repeated words, numbers, and symbols, a practice found in voodoo that recalls artist, uh, art critic Beauvoir Dominique's observation that of special importance is the spellbinding mastery of sequence and number, counting, literally tra translated as control, control in Creole, line struck numerology, alphabet, gibberish, aesthetics of sign and symbol, circle, square, alphabet, and number, elements of order, the fact of writing more important than what is actually written. In this way, Basquiat suggests that learning how to read and work with signs is a fundamental survival skill for blacks, Latinos, and other dispossessed groups. Apart from crossing out words, Basquiat often refused spelling conventions, including in works such as Flats Fix, which pays tribute to working class Brooklyn. A black and white drawing, it features a thin irregular tire above capital letters that reads Flats Fix, rather than grammatically correct Flats Fixed. This in turn can be understood as part of a larger critique of the homogenizing goal of Western knowledge system to the extent that the rejection of language standardization is also a refusal to privilege the institutions, groups, and interests of the powerful. This reminds us of curator Donald Cosentino's generative question in relation to the lack of standardization of Haitian Creole in the rendering of a given word, which history is empowered and which is obscured, whose pronunciation is privileged, what are the politics of naturalization? Moreover, Basquiat frequently invoked US minoritized languages and cultural codes to challenge the Western project of homogenizing and eliminating epistemological difference. In the works of Robert Farris Thompson, Jean Michel gracefully embodied the power to deal with history and facts in several languages. Equally important, when Basquiat evoked various languages, he did not translate to the center, that is, privilege the English monolingual observer or align language and nation, thus requiring a multilingual literacy to engage with his thought. This recalls Aldea's comment that some things can get translated. Bilingualism was the way to see that opened up artistic possibilities and new meanings. Fittingly, this was part of street practices such as graffiti, which featured thickly drawn abbreviated note names, texts, and numbers in English and Spanish, and a broader black aesthetic in which, as Hevich has written, duplicity, doubleness, and undecidedness are divested of the negative connotations attached to them in Western culture. One of many examples in the Basquiat corpus is anybody speaking words, a painting portraying a black figure with a cracked open head against a yellow background in which the word opera is reiterated three times. Whereas English speakers will probably interpret the words opera in the context of Italian musical traditions, and Italian speakers may also interpret it as a work of art, Spanish-speaking people will further recognize the word as in the verb operar, to operate. True to form in this painting, Basquiat appears to be referring to the word in all of these senses. From a hole left by a severed head, music seems to pour out, while the body is made of multiple lines implying stitches, veins, and DNA strands, suggesting either that an operation took place or is required. Although Basquiat knew some French, referenced Haitian politics, religion, history, and culture, and at times saw in the notion of Creole, as I mentioned, a parallel trope for his own artistic practice, he mostly employed Spanish, a language that he associated with Puerto Rican history and experience, critique Anglo-centric understandings of the world, and insert Latin America, the Caribbean, and diasporas, and global history. 
giving American policies to impose English in Puerto Rico after the U.S. invasion of, 19, of 1898, the in-case of Puerto Rican anti-colonial opposition via a defense of la lengua, as well as the stigmatization of Spanish-speaking immigrants to the U.S., and the pressure to lose their native uh, tongue in the school system, to insist on Spanish constitutes defiance to efforts of colonial control as submission to American national culture. Finally, Spanish words abound throughout Basquiat's work as part of drawings, sculptures, and paintings in titles such as pe uh, Crowns, Pesoneto, which is this one in the, in the bottom, Dos Cabezas, and Jace Milagro. As previously mentioned, the term cabeza is significant as it increased black worth in contrast to Euro American white artists such as Warhol and Picasso. Basquiat's extensive use of the word negro may also be understood to simultaneously refer to a pre-civil rights era where the devaluation of the enslaved Africans and their descendants were sanctioned by law, and to the ambivalent way as a potential term of both endearment and depreciation that it's used among Puerto Ricans. Furthermore, Puerto Rican and other Latin American vernacular terms such as gringo, which explicitly imply distance from American white identity and US actions in the global stage, similarly make repeat appearances in works such as Gringo Pilot and Nola Gay. In this early painting, Basquiat references Paul Tibet's pilot of the Enola Gay, the plane that carried one of the two atomic bombs dropped on Japan, acknowledges his fame by writing Respo Mundial, World Respect, but significantly does not crown him. Furthermore, the juxtaposition of English and Spanish serves to highlight commonalities and differences in the black experience in the Americas, and in case a specific Afro-Latino perspective. An example is Cassius Clay, a painting referencing the boxing champ Muhammad Ali, featuring a mask-like head against a green background framed by various words in Spanish. Pelo malo, bad hair, rompe cabeza, literally headbreaker, but also puzzle, campeón de boxeo, boxing champ, they cite and above names in English such as Cassius Clay and Lloyd Patterson. Basquiat's writing that, uh, then has much in common with New Yorker poetry as a method where our poets use Spanglish to challenge the hegemony of English and Anglophone culture and pressure it to convey the experience, expressions, and history of Afro-Latinos. Basquiat's Spanish also signified a way to connote an outsider status in relation to American culture hegemony and inscribe specific Puerto Rican structures of feeling. As Ferris Thompson adds, Basquiat switched to Spanish whenever he wanted to make a cover point or camouflage a question, and even to establish the terms of social and economic negotiation. According to Ferris Thompson, one day in the summer of 1986, a friend who spoke Spanish appeared at his door in the company of a rich and famous woman. I was there and watched them walk around. Suddenly the woman asked, point blank, how much is that painting over there? Jean-Michel, in a whisper to his friend, para ti o para ella? For you or for her? Meaning high price for a stranger, low price or even no price for a friend. In this regard, curator Kelly Jones' assessment that Basquiat used Spanish to primarily refer to the intimate and feminine, including family, food, and community, the Spanish-speaking world and the realm of the mother is not altogether accurate. While Basquiat did draw on Spanish to reference a range of intimate practices and memories, cooking in a piece called Arroz con Pollo, and family figures, Abuelita, which is probably one of my favorite of Basquiat's pieces. He most often referred to political figures, conquistadors, like Hernán Cortés, Puerto Rican politician Luis Muñoz Rivera, as well as terms associated with capitalism, peso neto, slavery, racism, and colonialism, as they're specifically experienced in Latin America and the Caribbean, gringo, negro, pelo malo. His own deployment of Spanish in order to separate friend or foe further exemplified this deeply political charge for, for Basquiat. Ultimately, to speak from Spanish and other minoritized languages was a means to critique the sovereignty of English, Euro-American cultural frames, and the marginalization of Afro-Latinos and Francophone blacks in the United States and elsewhere. In this way, he was the heir to the Afro-Puerto Rican historian Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, who similarly used Afro-Latino history to complicate Afrocentric narratives on blackness and built on the Afro-Latino thought of the 1970s, which articulated a critique of capital and imperialism in a global context. His practice thus recalls Henry Louis Gates' well-known argument of signifying as a method to critique the nature of white meaning itself, to challenge through a little critique of the meaning of meaning. So this last section is called Sovereign. Okay. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, Sovereign Impossible. So undoubtedly, Basquiat's use of words and crowns constituted a power visual language of contestation. Yet it's clear from the beginning that he also has ambivalences. 
about the reach of this language. While Basquiat celebrates black achievement or condemns European and US colonialism, he does not fail to note that whereas the rhetorics of sovereignty can at times provide a means to challenge sovereign power, claiming sovereignty within Western commodified systems of signification might be inherently violent and defacing. In this regard, whereas Basquiat's work appears to fully validate Charles Taylor's dictum that non-recognition or misrecognition can inflict harm, it also implies that Eurocentric recognition is asymmetrical and lost colonized people in the other's conception of self. There's perhaps no better example of this conundrum than Basquiat's heartbreaking painting, Irony of a Negro Policeman, in which he draws a figure of a black officer wearing a badge shaped like a crown on the left side of the chest. To the right of the officer, and in downward word motion, Basquiat writes the words irony, irony of a Negro policeman, and pawn. The officer's hollow features and severed of his right arm and leg suggest that the officer has been zombified by his desire for a piece of sovereign power. In addition to the quandary of recognition, Basquiat made explicit reference to the obstacles to national sovereign projects for Caribbean politics and Afro-diasporic people. This should not be uh, surprising given his family history in three places were very vexed history of sovereignty, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and the United States. <coughs> a key and rarely discussed work that directly um, challenges sovereignty in the Caribbean is the densely drawn 50 cent. Now, if you look at this, you will spend the rest of your life trying to figure this out. Uh, I am only going to talk about a couple of things here. Uh, Basquiat evokes three Caribbean contexts in this piece, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica, and their diasporas. And the, some of the play, ways that he does this is by mentioning the names of leading political figures from each country. Francois Duvalier, L'Overture, and the, most, the harder to decipher, Luis Muñoz Rivera, because it has a lot of crossed out. Uh, it's over there, <coughs> Luis Muñoz Rivera, hard to read. Um, significantly, Garvey's inscribed twice in the general style of a Jamaican 25 cent coin, hence the title 50 cent. Above Garvey's portrait, Basquiat writes RT Excellence, which approximates what appears in the actual coin, an honorary mode of address in Jamaica that is used for members of the Order of National Hero. Below, he writes Bank of America. Garvey's visualization as a coin is richly suggestive, but it simultaneously calls attention to multiple and contradictory phenomena. On the one hand, the coin underscores Garvey's importance to Jamaican state discourse as one of the country's first declared national heroes, even if he migrated to the United States, led a back to Africa movement, was deported from the US to Jamaica, and died in London, I quote, alone, broke, and unpopular, according to a premature obituary that supposedly when he read it, he died. Uh, on the other hand, Basquiat's visualization of Garvey as a coin accentuates the relationship between sovereignty and capital. The contradictory project of black valorization through commodification, the challenges of Caribbean economic viability within global capitalism, and the limits of black fame. Basquiat, however, explicitly links the Caribbean sovereign troubles to the sovereign violence of the United States. This includes the brutal US occupation of Haiti, which he assigns a 1921-1936 periodization rather than the standard 1915-1934, perhaps to highlight the 1921 US investigation of abuse claims in Haiti, in which the Marine commander declared that over 2,000 Haitians had been killed, resisting the occupation. He similarly invokes Operation Bootstrap, the name given to Puerto Rico's US-led economic mobilization, plan that triggered the mass migration of thousands of Puerto Ricans to cities such as New York as cheap labor, and Garvey's own movement back to Africa. Now, I have one minute left. So, um, despite the, so I will, I will wrap up. So, Basquiat suggests that despite having what he calls here blue ribbon commodities, like salt, sugar, rum, bananas, and even brain, uh, this is, doesn't quite uh, cohere around uh, a sovereign project. However, he does uh, provide some sense of respite uh, suggesting that the Caribbean will regardless literally stay afloat. This view is connoted through the uh, repetition of the phrases 300 cubits long and the ark, which explicitly refers to Noah's biblical ark. Yet, yet freedom is not predicated on the Western religious narrative alone, as the ark also conjures to other reference, the slave ship and the votive spirit of water, Agwe, who owns a boat and receives offerings in small vessels made of bark and other sailing materials. In relating all three references, the art inscribes the various meanings that blacks in the Americas have imagined to protect what is valuable in Caribbean life 
and escape the many floods that accompany it, including slave ships, invasions, dictators, and destructive policies. Art's capacity to link various historical periods, nations, and narratives also offers a different realm to call attention to the racist claim that these societies can never be sovereign or modern because of cultural limitations or racial inferiority. Um, the, last, uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about is towards the end of his um, career, he starts to give uh, up, let's say, um, the symbols of sovereignty and just want to call attention to the last to the last phase of his career. Not surprisingly, towards the end of his life, Basquiat painted fewer and fewer crowns and words, choosing to largely abdicate the language of sovereignty. In the words of Kelly Jones, as the work progressed, it is clear that the artist was painting his way into a space of communion, community, and connectivity. In his last years, he emphasized, his emphasis was increasingly on the human body and its frailties, dangling feet, severed hands, bleeding hearts. There are fewer human heads and words, and many more depictions of animals, particularly monkeys. Europeans law, European law was w uh, giving way to African and African diasporic luas. The timing of this ship may not have been accidental. In addition to Basquiat receiving criticism regarding the repetition of his imagery, this was also the year in which he faced one of the most painful moments of his career. Whereas New York Times critic Vivian Reynolds wrote in 1984 that Basquiat had a chance of becoming a very good painter as long as I can withstand the forces that would make him an art world mascot, in 1985 she concluded that Basquiat had already become a mascot. Basquiat had famously responded that I wanted to be a star, not a gallery mascot, but perhaps the damage was done. Three years later, Basquiat died of an overdose, seemingly unable to cope with the loss of friends and negative reviews. In retrospect, it is on denial that Basquiat's career illustrated the power of sovereign acts to challenge dominant structures. A testament to this is that Basquiat is persistently remembered today as he initially wished he would be, king of the 1980s art world. Basquiat's success is being viewed in this way such that a simple reproduction of his signature crown is enough to connote him. After Basquiat's death, fellow painter Keith Harry memorialized him with a paint triangle full of crowns, titled A Pile of Crowns for Jean-Michel Basquiat. Almost a decade later, in the opening scene of fellow painter Julian Schnabel's film, Basquiat, the artist appears as a young boy being crowned the heir of a modern art after looking at Picasso's Guernica. I invite you to see it uh, on YouTube. Uh, yet, similar to Caribbean diaspora intellectuals Claude McKay and C.L.R. James before him, the arc of Basquiat's work suggests that being king over subjects, territories, institutions, and discourses is not the same as freedom. That is, the vocabulary of sovereignty may still be too tied up with unitary notions of power and control. It is perhaps in this context that one of Basquiat's last paintings, Writing with Death, can be considered as a particularly compelling visualization of another direction. If in most other works, the black figure has his arms up, as if he was being literally arrested by sovereign desire and frightened by white recognition, the arms of the writer here are lower, without a halo or crown soaring to the unknown. Deploying an ashe gesture, right hand up, left hand down, he emphasizes a different source of power rooted in the religious practices of the African diaspora, where death is a new beginning, a passage into the spirit realm. Basquiat himself never made it to this new place where freedom may have dethroned sovereignty, but here, still as king of the line, he is drawing from it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Francis. Uh, I know we are a little bit late and the, the panels are starting, but I think we have like five minutes to, for questions, if you would like to, to ask some. Uh, Thank you for that talk. I think this is probably implicit in your paper, but um, I'd really like to ask you to um, comment specifically on the ways in which you think Basquette's work um, illuminates the idea of the urban. I know there are probably many um, points you could touch on there, but perhaps just one for the sake of time. Um, and in relation to performance, if you're able. Thank you. 
I mean, there's a lot <laughs> we can say about that. Um, I think the most, uh, the most obvious that's connoted or referenced um, in the piece as it is now is his origins as a graffitiist. Uh, now, as we know, Basquiat was uh, from a middle class background um, by and large, uh, so he was, um, you know, practicing graffiti of a certain kind. Uh, so, for instance, Basquiat wasn't so much uh, writing his graffiti in areas where his, let's say, peers of working class Brooklyn could see it. He was writing graffiti along the corridors of art establishment uh, spaces where people could see, people who made decisions about art could see it. Uh, so in that regard, he was definitely trying to call attention to this audience, to his work, uh, but also challenge the, the larger infrastructure and, and, and assumptions about the art world more generally. Uh, so I would say that from, from, from the moment that he draws his first line in public, uh, he's engaging with uh, spatiality of the city of New York and particularly the, the quarters of power of the city of New York. Um, of course, in, in, uh, in his own trajectory, there are many more connections even before that point. Uh, for instance, um, his, his mother, who was a, a Brooklyn-born Puerto Rican of immigrant parents, uh, would also um, take him through museums in New York, uh, so the whole resources of their urban space of a, of a global capital city like New York were available to him as a child. Uh, so we say that the city informs and is one of the earliest thematics of his work as well. So it informs his entire training as an artist, which he, he didn't even graduate high school. He left high school before graduating. He didn't go to college. So we say that his entire education as an artist pretty much happened in the city. Uh, uh, learning from the cultural institutions present there and also from street practices like graffiti. Thank you for your wonderful talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, my question is very uh, specific and because it surprised me, the painting of um, Cassius Clay, that he used Cassius Clay instead of Muhammad Ali. Uh, uh, and because every line matters, I'd like to, has a meaning, I'd right. like you to, what do you get from there? I mean, I think, um, well, there's a lot of things that happen uh, with Basquiat and words that uh, one of them is that he, he might bring up, uh, uh, let's say, Cassius Clay instead of Muhammad Ali, which immediately calls attention to uh, so-called uh, naming practices, slave naming practices, uh, self-naming practices. Um, so I would say that, that just that mention in that context re refers to a number of things. Temporality of the, of the work, like when, when, what's the moment that he's ref uh, talking about. Uh, and it's also uh, immediately a, a space, a site where you start thinking about, oh, but Cassius Clay, that exactly your question, became Muhammad Ali by his own practices of self-identification. Uh, which is in a way, I think, methodologically what he's doing in the, in the entire piece. Uh, which is bringing a multiplicity of ways of redescribing uh, a subject that is normally described another way in another language with other terms. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in, in that regard, you know, you, one of the things I try to say at the beginning is that in a Basquiat painting, precisely, you have a multiplicity of ways of relating what is happening because it's not a linear construction. Uh, so therefore, you can opt to relate Cassius Clay to Pedro Malo, for instance, and you reach a certain place, or you might relate Cassius Clay to Patterson and reach a different place, uh, you know, of signification. Uh, so in my, my reading, I mean, I didn't dwell on that particularly because I was more interested in, in the Spanish language words, but to me, it's to say Cassius Clay ver versus to say Muhammad Ali is to call attention to a process of uh, naming that is a, a work, I think, in the whole piece. Any other questions? Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It's been really fascinating. I, I am thinking, I haven't seen many of his works. I saw the film, but <laughs> not much yeah. of his work. And I'm thinking uh, if you could add something about gender in his... Sure. I, I uh, had a section, but... I, yeah. Because the, you mentioned the abuelita right. figure, and I would like to hear a bit more about that. Sure. 
Uh, there's a section that I didn't get to, to talk about, but uh, there's been a debate about gender uh, in Basquiat scholarship, uh, with some people uh, criticizing him for ignoring women, basically. Um, some people also uh, taking another uh, another uh, take on it, which is that his exploration of black male subjectivity is substantial enough, you know? Uh, but there's also... Um, the question of, and I think it has to do with my argument around sovereignty, is that for Basquiat, at the same time, it seems fairly clear that the realm of sovereignty is a male realm. So, for instance, in one of his pieces on Charlie Parker, he writes, you know, uh, young, only young kings get their heads chopped up, uh, chopped off. You know, so it's it, this is a definitely a male realm where he, where gladi gladiators of different kinds are, are battling for this crown. Um, at the same time, in my first piece, I, 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 um, I explore the ways that the mother tongue, the mother's culture, the mother as his first uh, teacher of art, uh, you know, plays out in the work. And now I'm working on another piece uh, that is uh, exploring more deeply the maternal side of Basquiat's family, because I've discovered a number of things that also uh, provide an even stronger case uh, for how important uh, that maternal sphere was. Uh, so it, we distinguish those two levels, like the importance of the maternal to his becoming an artist and his recognition of that. In fact, more than once he said, my art comes from my mother, uh, in very explicit terms. Um, but at the same time, when he's envisioning this sphere of culture where he wants to become king, uh, women are largely absent. There's only a handful of pieces in the in very vast corpus of Basquiat that explicitly um, represents a woman or a female figure. Um, one of the most powerful, uh, I think, is, is detail made from Olympia. Uh, um, so that, where he explicitly is looking at the ways uh, Western gay, white gays on black women uh, Abuelita is another example of that, uh, of how black women are, are important, arroz con pollo. So there's a number of them, but they're very, very few. So I think it depends on the, uh, the angle. Uh, you engage with gender in a very uneven way, in, in, in his, uh, both in his training, practice, and figuration. Yeah. It's any relation with the Latin kings with that movement, movement? I looked into that. <laughs> I looked into that. Um, according to Michael Holman, who was one of the bandmates of Basquiat uh, in Gray and the noise band, um, and my own uh, mapping of the Latin King's presence in New York, probably not. Uh, now, the Latin King's gang is older than Basquiat. Uh, it began in Chicago um, before Basquiat was born, but it didn't settle in New York until the late 1980s. Uh, so it's unlikely, uh, and Michael Holman was very explicit about it, I never had heard of them, and I don't think he has ever heard of them. So it doesn't seem to be a formative uh, influence. Now, if you read the almighty Latin Kings and Queens uh, manifesto and other materials of the gang as it developed in New York, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of resonances <laughs> between some of the ways that Basquiat um, use crowns to connote and signify the, the, the Latin King's gang, particularly its political phase, uh, does. But uh, it doesn't seem to be a direct influence, um, but rather, you know, resonances uh, about, you know, about the ways like certain groups uh, view crowns of certain backgrounds. Um, so yeah, I would say that after looking at it pretty deeply, I would, I reached the conclusion that it did not seem to be a formative influence, but certainly, you can make comparisons and see certain convergences between the two. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to leave it here because people are moving to the sure. to the panels. But Francis is going to be around. And thank, you so thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you.